On behalf of Baha'i Blog and the Baha'i Blogcast, uh, welcome everyone. It's me, your host, Rain Wilson, and I, I couldn't be more thrilled. I literally could not be more thrilled. Uh, I had a germ of this idea for the last two years. I've been wanting to do it. I've found some um, incredible uh, participants to this little convocation that we're having this conversation about the Baha'i faith, spirituality, and the mother of all issues, climate change. Um, so excited to have this discussion where we're filming it on a Zoom. So we'll see how that works. We're recording it as a podcast. Um, and I'm just thrilled to have, I keep wanting to say contestants. And our next three contestants, <laughs> <laughs> our, our three participants from all around the world are here. And before we get going, I, I just would love to hear a little bit about you guys. If you can introduce yourselves uh, one at a time, Christine, why don't we start with you, who you are, what your background is, where you're currently recording from, and, um, you know, maybe a little bit about what you hope to get out of this discussion. I am originally from Switzerland, um, but I live in the United States uh, with my family. And um, I teach the piano as a profession, but have always been very concerned about uh, environmental issues and have studied uh, climate change more seriously in order to be able to be of service uh, because just studying didn't seem to be um, useful. Um, and so um, I've served as faculty of the Wilmette Institute courses on sustainable development and climate change. And um, I also currently serve as secretary of the International Environment Forum. Oh, wonderful. And are, you're a member of the Baha'i faith. Uh, how did you become a Baha'i in, in Switzerland? I became a Baha'i in Switzerland. Yes. Yeah. And um, I have always, you know, um, been interested in the environment and then looked for Baha'i teachings, how they could help solve the problems of the environmental crisis, because it was already there when I grew up uh, in a different way. I didn't know about climate change, but there were other problems with the environment. And um, through the years, I could really find um, answers in the Baha'i teachings. Um, how we can address all these serious issues for us. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Afsane, would love to hear from you. Hi, I'm Afsane. I grew up in Luxembourg. I live in London. I have two small boys who got me obsessed on climate change issues. Um, and I started an independent magazine on the issues surrounding climate change and the solutions that can, can be considered um, at the towards the end of 2019. Great. What's the name of the magazine? Icarus Complex. And is your background in journalism? Yes. So I've worked in journalism and in publishing. Oh, wonderful. And is Icarus Complex... Um... Uh, a, a paper magazine or yes. is it only online? So it's a print magazine that comes out twice a year. And uh, we also have a website, but uh, they serve as a complement to each other. So they're, we don't really feature what we cover on uh, in print online. We try to make it complementary. And, and what is it you're hoping to achieve with your, uh, with your magazine, your periodical uh, focused on climate change? Um, so I really am interested in looking at issues from a holistic standpoint. Um, so we look at climate change through the lens of uh, the economy, finance, the law, agriculture, energy, and then you know, if we look at, um, for example, in the last issue, we look, looked at nuclear power and um, it tends to be a dividing issue within the environmental movement. So we mm. wanted to look at both sides and um, draw conclusions from it. Oh, wonderful. What a, what a wonderful service. Uh, we'll need to check that out. Icarus, Icarus magazine? Icarus Complex. Magazine. Icarus Complex. What is the Icarus Complex? So it's a term in psychology that means um, basically you're uh, 
ambition surpass your abilities and it's inspired by the myth of Icarus, the Greek myth, um, uh, Icarus who didn't heed his father Daedalus's warnings and flew uh, too close to the sun and then his wings melted and he drowned in the sea. So for me Daedalus um, is sort of equi equivalent to today's scientists who have warned us about what can happen if we don't heed their warnings. Wonderful. Wonderful. I've heard that Greek myth uh, referred to so many times. This may be the best use of, <laughs> of the Icarus uh, myth I've ever heard. So uh, that's great. And uh, Mr. Dahl, uh, you have uh, quite an esteemed uh, resume. Would love to hear, would love to hear about your background and your um, uh, and you, your interest and in work around climate change, which I know is extensive. Well, I'm Arthur Dahl. I'm a fourth generation Californian. Uh, I've always been a Baha'i, so I was raised in a Baha'i family. And in fact, it was Baha'i children's classes where I began to learn about the environment. We had a teacher named name of Vincent Brown, who'd written wonderful books about amateur naturalist handbook and so on. And so I decided to become a biologist and studied at Stanford University and I got a PhD at University of California at Santa Barbara. And I was just finishing my doctorate when the Santa Barbara oil spill came over my research materials. So I was doing pollution studies by default in 1969. So I was sort of thrown in the deep end of the environmental problems of the world already at that time. I then spent several years at the Smithsonian Institution working on coral reef ecology. I wanted to understand unity and diversity in biological systems so I could see how it might apply to human systems. And I set up in 1970, long-term monitoring on coral reefs, how they were changing with all the environmental changes that were coming. So I've been following you know, climate change and environmental issues, you know, back since it first, be, you know, sort of came into the radar of, of scientists, something to worry about. Uh, I then went to New Caledonia. I always wanted to be of service to developing countries. So I became the environmental advisor to all the Pacific Island countries and built a regional environmental program and a governmental program of all the countries. And, did everything from primary school curricula to setting up parks and reserves and so on. And then I joined the United Nations Environment Program. And uh, I also, in 1972, represented the Baha'i International Community at the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment. So it was sort of the beginning of the United Nations work on the environment. And then from the Pacific, I moved to UNEP, UNEP Environment Program. And I was coordinating United States system-wide Earthwatch. So I was responsible for coordinating all of the scientific community and the space agencies to monitor things like the, the climate change. And so I've been sort of deeply into the data yeah, ever since you know, it's been developing and still follow it quite closely. So you, know, I've, you might say, I've not, you know, I'm not a specialist on climate change, but it's been part of everything I've had to work with for the last 40 or 50 years. Wow, what, a, what an incredible story. What a wide range of... Um of work and uh, different different types of work on the environment. It's um, very impressive. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, Arthur, uh, on our discussion. I, I don't think anyone that's listening right now is kind of a climate change denier or climate change skeptic. I highly doubt that people tuning into the <laughs> Baha'i blog, <laughs> spirituality and climate conversation <laughs> are, are denying science. So, but that being said, uh, take us through this, this problem. Like, how serious is it? Um, how, how deeply is this uh, a global concern? Well, as I, as I mentioned, I've been walking this for a long time. And I think one of the things that struck me, you know, as I follow the science, is that uh, the actual changes in the climate and the speed of global warming are always higher than the highest predictions of the scientists. <laughs> It's clearly something that's accelerating faster than anybody expected. And, uh, and, and therefore, the time that we have to respond has been getting shorter and shorter. <clears throat> you know, I've seen it with my work on coral reefs, where you have coral reefs you know, getting too hot and bleaching and dying <clears throat> around the world. So people, scientists, sort of think, well, may, may not have no coral reefs left you know, by, by you know, the middle of this century, which would be the lost you know, of the first major ecosystem at a planetary scale. And of course, 400 million people depend on coral reefs and fisheries or for coastal protection. So it's already significant loss to see, see this happening. And yet we can't, it's not the reef itself, it's what's happening at the gl global level to climate that is causing that and many other problems. So uh, we have this new process accelerating 
and you know, we keep calling as scientists to do something about it, and yet the inertia in the system, the economic system, the multinational corporations, short-term interests, keep us from responding as we need to. And of course, you know, this is, I've seen in my work in science that science by itself doesn't convince people to change their behavior. You also have to get an emotional commitment, and it's not an intellectual understanding that, that does that, which is why the harmony of science and religion are so important, uh, because you know, beyond the science, you'll say, what moral ethical principles? You know, do we need to respond to this because you know, it's a moral responsibility, because the damage we're doing you know, to other people? And in fact, you know, the international governing body of the Baha'i faith has said that humanity would best and most effectively be served by setting aside partisan disputation, as we've seen so much in the United States, you know, pursuing united action that is informed by the best available scientific evidence and grounded in spiritual principles and then thoughtfully resigning our action in the light of experience. We don't have all the answers, we have to experiment, but it's only by combining spiritual principle and science that we can find a way forward that looks at everybody's interests and looks at the of the whole planet. And of course, the latest science, you know, as I say, it keeps getting worse and worse. They're now saying we have seven years to bring down carbon dioxide emissions significantly, or we're going to see irreversible catastrophic climate changes as runaway effects take place, you're already the Arctic, you know, the polar areas are melting very rapidly. And they've just sort of saying methane gas is bubbling out of the sea from the frozen methane under the sea. This is, a, this is a much worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So we could easily tipping points, we sort of go over the edge, the impossible to step back again. So it's really important that we act now. Uh, that's so well said. And, um... But I, I, before we move on, there's something you touched on there that I, I hadn't I had thought about a little bit, but I hadn't really uh, dug into, which is how the harmony of science and religion really has to do with climate change. Uh, like you said, uh, Mr. Dahl, uh, Dr. Dahl, Mr. Dahl, I don't know, um, <laughs> Arthur, Artie, yeah. um, uh, the the science isn't enough, um, as we've seen. So you had talked about moral and ethical beliefs, kind of spiritual beliefs that need to work in harmony with science. Christine, um, I know you've spoken a, a great deal about this, but um, how do you feel that science needs to work with, um, with faith to kind of shift our perspective? Yeah, um, you know, Science is an important tool to uh, learn about reality and to assess our problems. And it tells you how to solve things. Um, while religion gives us the ethical um, and moral uh, principles to decide what we should do with the scientific findings. Hmm. So, you know, when you see that the globe is warming and so many people suffering and uh, nature uh, being destroyed, uh, we need to make a, a moral choice, a, a spiritual choice that we have to take action and change course to, to, self, uh, to save humanity. And, and Christine, I know that you have... Uh spoken on some other reasons to be concerned about climate change, uh, climate impacts on nature, and also this seeing climate change through a, a lens of social justice. Could you say a little bit about those two aspects? Sure, yeah. So it is um, both, um, of course, a social justice issue, but let me first talk about uh, nature, as you uh, just said. Um, so many plants and animals cannot adopt quickly enough to the different climatic conditions, for example. And that's one reason why so many species are facing extinction. The intricate balance in ecosystems that evolved over long periods of times becomes disturbed. For example, when we think of the timing when birds feed their chicks and the peaks of caterpillars their food, it gets all out of whack. Many trees are dying because of the proliferation of bark beetles and other pests and diseases. So everything in nature is interconnected 
and we humans are part of this web of life. The Baha'i teachings say that every part of the universe is connected with every other part by ties that are very powerful and admit of no imbalance. However, we are now destroying this balance. We also see increasingly worse wildfires because of droughts and higher temperatures caused by global warming. And the scope of the loss of animals in the Australian wildfires is just incomprehensible. Biodiversity is extremely important for the functioning of the Earth's life support system on which we all depend. In addition, diversity even has spiritual significance. Baha'u'llah said that nature is God's will and that in its diversity, there are signs for men of discernment. Mm. But you asked about uh, social uh, justice, and that's really um, probably what um, strikes us the most as human beings. Um, because when you think about that the rich people of the world are responsible for most of the carbon emissions that cause global warming, and that the poor who have contributed the least are suffering the most from the impacts of climate change. And there are many reasons why poor people and indigenous people are more vulnerable to climate change. For example, storms are becoming much more severe and destructive because of global warming. Last week's storm Iota in the Caribbean destroyed many poor people's houses. Poor people generally don't have the means to move away from harm and to rebuild their homes and livelihoods. Hmm. But the farmers in Africa especially uh, are um, are especially affected. They are already struggling, um, you know, just to survive because they are poor. And a warming climate is a matter of life and death for them now. They are suffering by um, from worsening heat waves, water scarcity, droughts, and in some areas, uh, flooding. Many more people, especially children, are dying because of malnutrition. This year, Southern Africa has also experienced a terrible assault of locusts, which could multiply more often because of changes in rainfall patterns. Poor people everywhere are also much more affected by the rise of food prices because of declining agricultural yields. So when you think about that the lifestyle of rich people is mainly responsible for their suffering, it becomes clear that this is a matter of justice. Indigenous people and people of color are much more vulnerable to climate change, which makes it also a matter of racial justice. Hmm. This holds true in the US as well. African Americans tend to live in the more highly polluted neighborhoods and urban heat islands, and the ever worsening heat waves can be deadly under these conditions. Baha'u'llah said that the light of man is justice. I think that increasingly more people see climate change now as an urgent social justice issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is two, two key teachings of the Baha'i faith that have been laid out as intimately connected with climate change. Uh, one is the harmony of science and religion, and the other, um, as you've brought up, is uh, the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. Um, there's an Oxfam study that the richest 10% of the people produce half of the planet's um, individual consumption-based fossil fuel emissions with a bottom three and a half billion people, three and a half billion people produce only 10% of those emissions. But those three and a half billion people are also living in countries and in areas, localities that are most vulnerable to climate change. So, um, the uh, and you also mentioned earlier on kind of the all the Baha'i quotes about nature and uh, nature's diversity, unity and diversity. Arthur mentioned that in relation to coral reefs. So we see some spiritual themes starting to bubble to the surface of this kind of conversation. Um, Afsane, do you have um, uh, 
specific examples of how climate change is affecting people and any thoughts on this kind of interactivity of these spiritual themes and and uh, this kind of giant global science-based conflict? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So I think um, two important components are tapping into your sense of empathy and justice, as was mentioned. And so we need to tell stories that are uh, that make people be able to relate um, to what's happening around the world. So I think it's also important for the people in the Western world who, um, you know, have high carbon intensive lives um, to realize that the effects of climate change aren't just happening in far off places to people that are very foreign to you, but it's also happening, you know, uh, in Europe, it's happening in Wales. There's a series of um, villages around the coast of Wales that have been decommissioned, uh, which uh, practically means that the city council no longer can bear the cost of financing the holding up of the seawall. So all of um, the houses that are along the coast are at risk of being flooded. And so officially decommissioning a town means that you're telling all of the town's inhabitants to go somewhere else and find another place to live. But a lot of people who have come there in the first place are retirees. They spend all of their uh, money in the house that they have, which now has no more value because mm. of the decommissioning. Uh, young couples uh, can't get mortgages because it makes no sense to mm -hmm. live in that area anymore. In the US, um, you have the example of the island of uh, Jean Charles, which is off the coast of Louisiana where uh, gradually sea water has crept in and mm -hmm. um, the federal government has granted, I think $48 million um, of taxpayer money to um, the state of Louisiana to move those people and relocate them. So on the one hand, you have a financial cost that is related to that, but then also your, um, there's the social fabric of people who live around each other and live in a neighborhood, uh, and now they have to be scattered away. Nobody knows where, how, when. Mm, and it's mm. happening also in Alaska and everywhere. And I think, um, in so we're not going to we're not going to have decommissioning of of Beverly Hills, and we're not going to have <laughs> decommissioning of of Hyde Park in London. We're going to have decommissioning of some of these poorer areas, some of these coastal areas that are are impacting poorer people more and more, uh, as yes. well as the islands in the South Pacific, there's whole islands where the population is going to need to be moving over the next 20 years, like yeah. relocating. So I think also what's important though in the notion of justice is not to realize just what is happening to people from the effects of climate change, but it's an also a very important concept to consider when you consider transitioning away from fossil fuels. Uh, you have to be just and find solutions that really work for everybody. You know, in mm -hmm. France, for example, they raised the fuel tax and you had the Gilets Jaunes protests because what that really meant was that people could no longer afford to drive their car to get to their pl place of work. Mm -hmm. Or if you say that, oh, you know, we're going to build a bunch of wind farms, um, so the people who used to work on oil rigs can now work on oil uh, on wind farms. You have to ensure that they are able to uh, make the same kind of livelihood and live with the same kind of dignity that they did before. So it's also a notion to keep in mind when you're transitioning away and trying to find solutions for the climate crisis. I had never thought about that before. That's really um, uh, that's really insightful. Um, the uh respect and uh, care that need to be shown as we make that transition um, to, to taxi drivers, to people that, that rely on gasoline for their tractors. Um, uh, it's one thing to say, we're just gonna have electric cars from now on. Well, they cost more, mm -hmm. you know? And what about, you know, a poor family that can barely afford a, a little four cylinder you know, Hyundai or Kia or something like that. And now we're going to kind of force them to buy an electric car. Like th there has to be 
social justice has to be kept in mind um, in that transition as well. That's, that's, that's very well said. Thank you very much. Um, Arthur, your thoughts? Well, I think there's also the problem of, I might say, intergenerational justice. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing to destroy the, much of the planet now will have an impact on you know, our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. And our, our, our very short-term you know, view, ignoring the evidence because we want to keep making profits now, uh, is enormous threat. As we see with Greta Thunberg and the school strikes for the climate, you know, the kids are aware that this is their future that is being affected. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so we have to look at the, the, the implications of that. There, for instance, some of the impacts in the future, we talked a bit about sea level rise already. Uh, the present estimates are at least one meter, three feet in this century, which would mean that half of Florida would go underwater. So it's not just you know, goodbye to, uh, you know, to a few islands somewhere else. You know, with you know, many coastal cities will become undefensible you know, in that period of time, and that will continue. You know, if all of Greenland melts, that's six meters you know, or 20 feet of sea level rise, imagine how much of coastal areas we flooded around the world. And of course, places like you know the tropics and say South Asia and so on, if they get much hotter, they become uninhabitable. They become lethal for people to stay outside in the heat for long periods of time. They will die from it. So people just have to move away. You've got storm damage, wildfires, droughts increasing. So the human suffering as this accelerates will be enormous with hundreds of millions of people permanently displaced from where they're living now and having to find some other place to live. You know, I lived for many years in the Pacific Islands, as I mentioned, I was working there. And think countries like the Marshall Islands or Kiribati or Tuvalu will disappear entirely. What does it mean when your whole nation has disappeared? How can you be citizens of a country that no longer exists? So you know, they lose their culture, they lose nationality, they, they lose everything. Uh, so, and so I think this is, these are the kinds of things that is not just what's happening now, it's what's going to happen in the decades immediately ahead and then beyond that. That means we really have to be concerned about it in terms of responsibility to future generations. One other danger, I think, is the fact that this is irreversible. You know, we're reaching a point, tipping points, where once things accelerate, they even go faster and faster. For instance, when the ice in the polar areas melts, you go from a reflective white surface to a dark surface that absorbs more heat. And this is why the poles are heating much faster than the rest of the world. Because at the same time, you have frozen methane below the ocean, Arctic Ocean bottom. As it warms up, it turns to gas. It's a very you know, fat, you know, terrible greenhouse gas, much more than carbon dioxide. You destroy the Amazon rainforest, it turns into a savanna where forests can no longer grow. And you turn the forest from a carbon sink to a carbon source. So we have all these things that if we allow go much further, we'd never be able to come back again. Mm. So this is daunting, it can be overwhelming. We've heard a lot about um, just how, how grim this is, how vital this is, how challenging this is. And also like the more I dig into this topic, uh, uh, I, I went up to Greenland uh, last year to do a documentary on climate change and I'm serving on the board of a of an Arctic climate change organization called Arctic Base Camp um, with uh, Dr. Gail Whiteman and uh, Christine Figueres. And uh, the more you start to peel the onion, the more complicated it gets. It is a really, it is a granddaddy of issues because it is so, everything is so interconnected. It's so, uh, it, 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 it's so interconnected. And so, uh, but let's let's focus. Let's so let's focus on solutions, and focus on some spiritual perspectives and spiritual solutions. Look, why is climate change a spiritual challenge, uh, Arthur? Well, you know, what we're talking about the the with the planet, it's a symptom of this spiritual imbalance in our society. We've become mm -hmm. a very materialistic civilization looked only at the material side of life. We've ignored 
many the social and spiritual there are real purpose as human beings. It's not just to consume more and get richer. And therefore, in fact, the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, warned us over 100 years ago when he said, the civilization so often vaunted by the learned exponents of arts and sciences will, if allowed to overleap the bounds of moderation, bring great evil upon men. The day is approaching when its flame will devour the cities. Now that's quite a, that's a word 150 years ago. And mm. we've gone to an extreme on the material side. We need to bring it back into balance. Say, maybe there are more important things than material wealth, our social relationships, you know, our culture, art, science itself. These are things that can grow forever. They don't have the same limits as our material consumption. And you know, I, that's why I think this is, you know, we also you know, read in the Baha'i writings, we cannot segregate the human heart from the environment outside us. He said that once one of these is reformed, everything will be improved. Mm. Man is organic with the world. His inner life molds the environment and is itself deeply affected by it. The one acts upon the other, and every abiding change in the life of man is a result of these mutual reactions. So I think if we follow these Baha'i principles, and there are many others, and we envision an enriching civilization, we could create a new planetary balance for sustainability, getting away from the over-materialism that we have now and building a new civilization that's very rich, but in other dimensions. Uh, beautifully said. Thank you so much. Christine, I know you've, you've spoken uh, about this uh, in great detail at the Wilmette Institute. Um, your thoughts? Well, what Arthur just said, you know, um, the materialism is a real problem. And, um, and I think it's because when people are not connected to a higher purpose in life, they have to fill their inner emptiness with material things. So materialism results in excessive consumption, which destroys the planet. So we really need to rethink what it means to be a human being. The Baha'i teachings say that we are spiritual beings. And only when we live in the spirit can we be truly happy. Hmm. And spirituality is really the antidote for materialism and consumerism. A spiritual outlook can help us shift the emphasis from consumption to well-being and a meaningful life. So being happy with less material things is good for our soul as well as good for the planet. On the level of community, the climate crisis forces us to recognize our interconnectedness with all of humankind and all other life. It forces us to read reality, to assess the current and future needs of our community and to build solidarity within our community as well as with the whole world. The Baha'i teachings say that even decisions taken at a local level must advance the good of humankind in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Very well said. So we're talking about shifting spiritual perspectives and, and uh, looking at different spiritual approaches, thinking more holistically about these issues. Um, Afsane, uh, any thoughts on that? Yes, so I think that you need to look at everything in in moderation too um that's another one of uh, another the, okay the, another spiritual teaching to throw in the hopper there yeah yes mm -hmm. uh for example you know if you um consider that there's a big push for example to switch over to electric cars then you need to make sure that on the other end of it you know when you use lithium that the lithium mining that go is behind um you know, the creation of batteries doesn't bring with itself its own set of problems. So it, it's really important to, to look at um, things in a well-rounded way so that you're not creating one problem in a different corner by trying to solve um, another problem. And I think um, from a community perspective, it's really consultation that you can that can be applied that will help you overcome that as a challenge. So that's another one. I just want to kind of slow yeah. this down. So there's so many Baha'i teachings and um, spiritual foundational uh, beliefs that come to play in dealing with climate change. We've talked about harmony of science and religion. 
right? We've we've talked about the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. We've talked about uh, unity and diversity. Um, um, I know there's a few more I've missed here along the way, um, but moderation in all things is one. And now you just brought up consultation, uh, which needs to happen. Obviously, on a you mentioned a community level, but also. Yeah on an international level, which happened in the Paris agreements, yes. which you, the US officially does not ascribe to any longer, but it was a, it was a great first step, um, right. which by the way, and I had a conversation with Haldor Thorgelson or whatever his name is. I don't, I'm sorry, my apologies. Thorgerson. Thorgerson. Thank you, thank you, Thorgerson. My apologies to the Icelandic, uh, the great Icelandic people, but um, he was intimately and intricately involved in those in those discussions and putting them together. So, you know, we talk about Baha'is being, um, you know, the leaven um, and, and help promoting dialogue and uh, promote spiritual concepts. Uh, he was integral in those in those discussions, which I was very, very pleased to learn. Yeah, I was in Paris, too. For the negotiations. Oh, you were Arthur. Oh, that's yes. wonderful. What yes. what role did you play in those Paris agreements? Well, it, it was partly representing the Bahai International Community, and partly to our international environment forum, of Bahai inspired environmental organization. We had a series of side events about holding governments accountable, about hmm. you know taking care for all of those who, who are suffering, and you know looking at, at the implications and bringing in a whole series of Bahai principles that can help us to address the issues. And we had standing room only, you know crowds for the presentations that we gave around the Paris meeting, as we have for a number of other United Nations conferences that I've been involved in. So I've worked within the United Nations, but also outside bringing these issues to these UNM fora so that we can find agreement, we can consult on the positive side of things and find good ways forward. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And um, what do we need to do, Arthur? What are some solutions? Basically, we have to change everything in our material society. Okay, uh, good. Let's yeah, call it yeah. a day. Thank you so no, no, much. No, no, no. Thanks that's for tuning so, in, everybody. That's why it's so and, difficult. Um, you know, that's why it's so difficult. Kidding. No, <laughs> that's why it's so difficult because you know some problems are easy to fix. You know, when there was a there were holes in the ozone layer because of certain refrigerant gases, you know, we could simply change the gases and it solved the problem. But hmm. you know, we when we have a whole civilization powered by fossil fuels, coal and oil and so on, <clears throat> for the last 150 years. <clears throat> We have to say, how do we change to a whole different energy source with new technologies you know, to, to, to stop reducing all of that carbon? We have the technologies. We know what needs to be done. It would take 10 or 15 years to make the change if we really wanted to. But it's the political will and the vested interests that are blocking us from changing. We also have to change agriculture. Agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gases, methane mm -hmm. from livestock, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's about 15% about of the greenhouse gases come from agriculture, intensive you know, farming as well. So to change how we produce food, so we're looking more diversified, regenerative food production instead of the very intensive things that are the good profits for big corporations, but they're not what we need. We can feed us other ways, but it's not so profitable for big companies, and so they don't encourage that. In fact, they fight against it. We're going to change how we use transportation to redesign our community so we don't have to travel so much. So you can get to work and do your shopping without having to get in the car you know, every time. Uh, so we redesign our communities at a more human scale, which is better to live in you know, as well. We can't keep destroying nature and therefore we have to stop deforestation, recreate forests so that we can again, absorb that carbon from the atmosphere through natural biological processes and maintain biodiversity at the same time. There are many others, but we really have to do everything at once because we have to change things so quickly. We've waited too long now and it's really you know, an urgent catastrophic reaction as we have already with the pandemic. We have to, which shows that we can in fact change quickly if we want to. Uh, wonderful. Afsane, are there individual actions that we can take? Yes, there are a number of individual actions uh, that you can take. It starts with your own lifestyle at home. Um, you know, um, you can take a lot of steps to reduce energy and water usage um, at home. You could do your laundry um, at off-peak times. Uh, probably one of the biggest contributions you could make is to change your diet and consume less meat, um, buy locally, buy mm -hmm. less packaged food. Um, 
fly less, drive less. Um, but I would also say that from a financial perspective, um, you know, if you're part of a pension scheme, it's really important to investigate where that fund is invested in to make sure they, they're not invested with uh, fossil fuel companies and they respect ESG ratings. Um, you should get involved locally to see if there's a local, a local activist chapters or um, plans to plant trees or have uh, local garden schemes and agriculture schemes. Um, and then uh, the biggest step is really to get your voice heard politically. Um, you can start at the local level and move your way up. Well, I, I think this is important to note because a lot of people I imagine listening and people that I, young people that I talk to, they just feel overwhelmed and like, I can't make a difference. Like what, there's 7 billion people on the planet. I'm one person, what good does my actions do? And this is one of the tricks of climate change is that they're right and they're wrong in mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you're absolutely right. One person changing is not going to do it. But if one person changes and then it's a hundred person people, and then it's a thousand, then it's 10,000, then it's a hundred thousand people changing their behaviors. Yes. Um, and then that's 10 million. And then that's a hundred million. And then that's a billion. Well, then we've got some real significant change. So this kind of change as witnessed by, you know, the stunning worldwide kind of social revolution started by Greta Thunberg um, is uh, it has to, you know, let there be peace in the world and let it begin with me. You know, it, it, it can and has to start on an individual level. And it's, yes. it's something I struggle with, you know, I, you know, if I want a new pair of sunglasses and I can just click a button and get them on Amazon and they're at my house in two and a half days, you know, I like having blueberries year round. Well, if mm -hmm. I have blueberries in winter, they're being flown up from Chile. You know, do I need to buy blueberries, fresh local blueberries and freeze a ton of them and use them in smoothies or whatnot throughout the year, but make sure that I'm, um, you know, sustaining things locally. It's gonna, it's gonna require some sacrifice as Definitely. well. Yeah. But I think the other important thing that you said is that, you know, we have that saying where we say that individual drops form an ocean, but I think unless those drops band together, you're not going to form that ocean. And so I think it's really important to become active with organizations and, and speak around you so that you get more and more people on board, especially given the limited time frame we have. Yeah. Christine, how can this climate change crisis have an influence on human spiritual growth? Well, I think the existential threat of climate change helps us see our place in the universe, and it helps us to abandon an arrogant attitude toward nature. In other words, it teaches us humility. It also pushes us to develop empathy towards others and solidarity. And it demands that we abandon our ego and narrow self-interests. And according to the Baha'i teachings, letting go of the ego is our ultimate goal for our spiritual development as well. Baha'u'llah said, let your vision be world embracing rather than confined to your own self. So we can be mindful of the effects of our actions on nature and on other human beings. It also creates consistency between our beliefs and practice when we reduce our harmful impact on the environment and actively engage in some constructive climate action. And I just had a thought to what um, you were discussing before mm -hmm. about the individual actions. So we, if we all, um, adopt more um, responsible behavior, uh, you know, this has a, an effect on the market as well, you know, mm. because if everyone only wants to buy um, responsibly produced food or other things, you know, um, population will support the more constructive businesses, 
those mm, that mm. are responsible. Yeah. Uh, so that, that will also give a market signal. It will change the whole culture and it, it will, population will demand, you know, change. Um, uh, and also on the political level, you know, when people then get involved and vote. Um, so uh, the collective individual consciousness and uh, sense of responsibility and action has an effect but of course mm. it, it will take some time but it can also go rather quickly as we can see with uh, the pandemic you know people can change their behavior very quickly and when many people do it it does have an, an effect when everyone wears masks we can you know combat the pandemic very effectively mm. um, well, speaking of the pandemic, Arthur, um, I've often thought that this this pandemic is kind of a, a wake up call and a and a warm up uh, for humanity to deal with uh, the climate change, which is much broader in scope and much more complicated and difficult than even the coronavirus. So, uh, how do you see the link between the two? Well, I think it's 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 basically it's showing us that we are a single human family. On this planet, oh, hmm. you know everybody's being infected by it in every country of the world. You know the, it, it has happened with amazing speed. So it's a demonstration of the, the unity of the human race, which is one of the basic principles, you know, of the Baha'i faith. Oh, and you know, nobody's protected until everybody is protected. In the same way that with climate change, uh, you, no country can sort of say it's not going to affect us. We're going to uh, make it illegal for the climate to change here at home within our borders. Uh, that's simply not not possible. You know, but also you know, the virus jumped from animals to humans, which is warning us that our interconnectedness with nature hmm. requires us to respect natural areas, to stop encroaching in ways that increase contact between wild animals and humans, which is what produces zoonotic you know, diseases. Hmm. And of hmm. course, I think the pandemic also, by slamming the brakes on our economy, at least in the short term, is giving the opportunity to build back better, not simply to go back to what we had before. It's ah. like, you know, it's, you're already... We've begun a process of rapid change, and now is the time to invest. Not, we don't go and subsidize the fossil fuel industries and the airline companies and so on, but put the money into building new jobs for the people in the new industries that will give us a better civilization you know, coming out of this. The Baha'i International Community has said that this will allow us to usher in a new paradigm by means of which we can understand our purpose and responsibilities in an interconnected world a new standard by which to evaluate human progress, as we've said, and a mode of governance faithful to the ties that bind us as members of one human race. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, we're talking about spiritual solutions to a, a, a problem that is a material problem. It's a science-based problem. We're releasing too much carbon into the atmosphere. This is creating a heat blanket over the <laughs> earth. But it's much more complicated than that. But have you seen, let's talk about some success stories. I mean, Arthur, you've done a lot of work in the South Pacific. Um, have you seen some success stories by those local communities and in, in, uh, spiritual-based solutions? Yeah, well, I think an excellent example on the country of Vanuatu, uh, on the little remote island of Tana, where the Baha'i faith has been established for you know, decades now and has become very well in the community. They were hit a few years ago, like just before you know, the, the Paris Climate Conference, by one of the worst cyclones or hurricanes in history. Hmm. Enormous winds that just flattened everything on the island. And wow. these were very simple Baha'i communities, but they were organized with a local elected body their young people had been studying Baha'i principles. The pre-adolescents had been learning how to be altruistic and help others to service projects. The day after the cyclone, the kids were out there clearing the streets, helping old people find their belongings and the remains of their house again. You know, the local Baha'i assembly met to say, what are our priorities? They didn't say, we're waiting for help to come from outside. You know, We're not going to depend on aid. We're going to rebuild ourselves. And very quickly, they put things back together again. They overcome this. And in fact, one of my Baha'i friends who'd been there for many, many years, you know, worked with the government to develop a training program in community resilience that is being used in every community across the country. 
You know, mm-hmm. The government saw this is the kind of approach we need to, because you know, even with the pandemic, you know, they were hit by another slide cone. They were afraid to let aid come in because they would bring the disease with them, and they were still disease free. But because they had built their own capacity to be resilient in these crises and to help each other and to apply spiritual principles and function their communities, you know, in a unity for the whole country, you know, it works. Mm. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. That's inspiring. That's inspiring. And there's another one, building capacity at the grassroots, yes. right? Yes. Why we're doing all this work with the junior youth and the youth, exactly. youth and devotional gatherings and service projects. It bears um, fruit when you need it. Yeah. And home visits. Yes. That's all connecting us on the, on the grassroots. Afsane, any uh, other spiritual success stories? Yes. In Nepal, um, also on after the effects of um, COVID, a lot of migrant workers went back to Moti Basti and um, the local spiritual assembly uh, got together with the community and they decided to um, grow their own food to be resilient into the future. So the migrant workers who came were matched together with landowners uh, whose land wasn't um, cultivated. So they're cultivating that land and they hope to provide food for the local community. Christine, any examples you can you can think of, you know about? Yeah, there, there is a Fundaic, uh, a Baha'i inspired organization. It provides a quality education for marginalized rural youth in Colombia and, and other uh, countries in Latin America. Their holistic curriculum includes independent and creative thinking, values and service to the community. Much of the educational program is based on agriculture and what the students learn is relevant for them already now and not just in the future. Fundaik has helped the empowerment of girls and has contributed to the social and economic development of the local population. Strengthening the economy and diversifying agriculture has become really important because coffee growing has become very difficult because of climate change. The school also teaches to be thankful to nature and to understand our impact on the land for future generations. It combines the old traditions of the farmer with the insights and best practices from modern agriculture. Agricultural practices are based on fairness and cooperation. When COVID hit Colombia, 10 million people became unemployed and Fundaic has supported initiatives aimed at food self-sufficiency. For example, the creation of home gardens and the cultivation of larger farming plots. Fundaic has been providing workshops and online classes and distributes a monthly bulletin that connects participants across the country to a growing body of knowledge being generated from the local initiatives. Fundaic's efforts are really transforming society and make it more resilient to climate change impacts. Oh, beautiful. Wow, those are, those are some great examples that give us hope. So work can be done individually, work can be done on on a community level and work obviously needs to be done on an international level. Um, and we've, we've touched on all of those. And I guess before we go, and this has been really, again, anything having to do with climate changes, you, you can't encompass the, the vastness and complexity of it in a 50 minute or a one hour conversation. So this is just a taste for people. But um, before we go, I just, I guess I want to ask each of you individually to like, we've been speaking a lot of policy and science and, you know, perspectives, but I would love to hear from you individually, personally, on a heart level, what inspired you to engage in this issue and in your prayers, in your meditation, when you're reading the Holy writings, um, what is, what is your greatest um, what is your greatest wish? What, 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 if you could impart anything to your friends, family, coworkers, to the world, um, from the teachings of Baha'u'llah, what would that be? Christine? 
Well, um, it's always challenging to have hope in with the dire uh, scientific predictions there are. So, um, but I still have hope because of two things. First, there are more and more people all over the world who really care about climate change and do their best to help mitigate it. These people come from all walks of life and from different religions. And the second and the main reason why I still have hope for the future are the following words of Baha'u'llah. Each one of the ordinances we have revealed is a mighty stronghold for the preservation of the world of being. When I read this, it really made my day or my life. Say, say, it, say it one more time. <laughs> yes. Each one of the ordinances we have revealed is a mighty stronghold for the preservation of the world of being. And it has been very exciting for me to see how the spiritual and social teachings of the Baha'i faith can really guide us onto a path of living in harmony with each other and with the earth. And today we have mentioned a few of these teachings, but of course, we couldn't talk about everything. Um, one of other teaching that just comes to my mind that we haven't really talked about is uh, gender equality. People may think, why gender equality? Does it have anything to do with climate change? Mm. But it does, as so many other teachings of, of the Baha'i faith. Because um, when you educate girls, first of all, the, uh, women are really um, the factor in society that are more nurturing and have connection with the earth. Mm. Um, but... Moreover, it helps to um, curb population growth. One important reason why climate change is an issue is that we have increasingly more people on the planet. So mm. if people are empowered, uh, if women are empowered, um, it has been shown that this, this has a strong influence on population. Um, yes. The, and uh, the United Nations have has seen that and that's why, or that's one of the reasons, in addition that it's a human rights issue, of course, but uh, that's one of the reasons why the United Nations also put much emphasis on the empowerment of women. Mm, mm, yes, an educated girl has uh, not only less children, but has children later on in her life that she's more able to care for and is much less likely to get sold into sex slavery or, or uh, uh, because she's more empowered in in making more uh, choices, you know, for education and uh, economically uh, as well. Um, Afsane, what about you? What 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 got you into this? And just speaking from your heart, like, what is your greatest hope? And what is the what is the spiritual guidance that you really kind of? Uh, kind of hit your soul to? So what got me into this is my children. You know, as I mentioned, I have two small boys and I, I want a beautiful future for them on this planet. And um, so that's why I care. Um, in terms of my connection with the faith in this, I'm incredibly grateful to be born into the Baha'i faith. You know, as a teenager, whenever I would talk about my faith or um, about the Baha'i principles, it was almost regarded as quaint and cute, uh, these peace-loving bunch of people, you know. But now we've grown into a world where it's not just quaint and cute, but it's extremely practical. And all of these uh, principles that we have, I find, are really a blueprint to make this world not only a better place, but a purely livable place. And apart from all the principles that we mentioned, I think one of the ones that is a recurring one for me, um, the importance of it is the independent investigation of truth. Uh, when I was growing up, I only looked at it uh, in terms of religion, but I now look at it in terms of everything, especially in this polarized world 
we live in where we're constantly stuck in these echo chambers on uh, social media, I think we each have a duty to really do our utmost to try to learn the most about a subject outside of the realm of our echo chamber. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to say is that besides um, sort of the spiritual blueprint, I also see um, parallels um, with our administrative order. Uh, you know, at the after the Extinction Rebellion protests happened here in London, a lot of local councils adopted what they called citizens assemblies where uh, citizens from a local community come together and they consult uh, together and they try to move the political agenda from a grassroots level. And for me, this almost coincides with, you know, our administrative order where you start with the local spiritual assembly and then you move to the national spiritual assembly and then the house of justice. Mm, so I'm mm. incredibly grateful to, um, be part of the Baha'i community. And that's really the one thing that gives me hope. For the future. Wonderful. Arthur, what about you? Well, I've already explained that uh, my whole life has been devoted to this, basically. As a Baha'i, I wanted to be of service. Science was something I seemed to be, you know, really good at and uh, been drawn into this even before it was a popular thing to do. So my, in a sense, professionally and personally, much of my life has revolved around addressing issues like climate change and all the related issues. And it's not just climate change, everything's linked to everything else. And then you have to also address the economic system and the social system and all the rest of it. But I think in terms of the principles that we really need to look at now, one of course is unity and diversity. There's not one single solution to the climate change issue. And what, say, America needs to do is very different from what, say, Zimbabwe or you know, Vanuatu or need to do. Uh, we need to converge on a goal from different perspectives, meeting different needs in our population. And therefore, we need a lot of people experimenting, exploring what is relevant to us in our own community, our own situation, with that need to achieve the unity of purpose in terms of the well-being of the whole human race. And having that, that ultimate vision that we need to look for the common good and not any particular narrow good as, as part of the, uh, you know, the effort forward. I think another principle that's key to it all has been also part of my life has been always being of service. How can I use whatever abilities or knowledge or talents I have to be of service to other people? And it may be, you know, you know teaching a children's class, which I do at the moment, or maybe you're doing something with the United Nations at a global level. We just written a book this year on reforming global governance and how do we build a system of governance at the global level that can manage the climate change issue, that can that even adopt laws that are needed in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. If people aren't gonna do it voluntarily, then we need to have some kind of regulation. So how might this work in, in the world of today? And I think I'll be coming back to what Christine said as well, having a positive vision, having hope. In fact, I just wrote a book last year, In Pursuit of Hope, A Guide for the Seeker. I, I've been telling all the terrible things about the environment for 50 years, and it's so depressing. What can I do to counteract that by saying something positive and good for a change? And that means saying, being, looking realistic. Yes, we have serious problems, yet we're facing the catastrophic situations, but we can find the good side, we can work together, and we have the positive vision of the we can come through it. And I think that's the promise of the Baha'i faith, really, is that these difficulties are the things that we need to purify what's wrong in society and to build a better world on the other side. And if you all have that vision, then we can face the challenges ahead in that positive vision of helping others, loving others, loving the, the, the world, and through that living positive spirit, building the better world of the future that will come out of this crisis. Wow. So, so great. Uh, so well said, um, Arthur. And uh, by all of you as well. So yes, these fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come. That's one thing that can and will give us hope. So I wanna thank all the panelists. Uh, again, I wish we had more time. This is about an hour long discussion. We could go on for another five hours. Um, I want to direct folks to um, the work of our esteemed panelists, Arthur Dahl has Many books, uh, uh, one is this one he mentioned on global governance and the emergence of global institutions of the 21st century. He has a book called The Eco Principle. He has a book called In Pursuit of Hope, A Guide for the Seeker. 
and um, also some uh, uh, unless and unless and until a Baha'i focus on the environment, uh, published in the '90s, and also several books that I actually own uh, about Mark Toby. So uh, <laughs> we'll have to have you back on the show to speak about Mark Toby, one of my favorite uh, Baha'i artists. Um, and uh, the Icarus Complex, please subscribe, uh, follow, learn about the, is there anything Afsane that people need to do if they want to learn more about the Icarus Complex? Well, you can go on our website, IcarusComplexMagazine.com. And we also have an Instagram page. You can check out Wonderful. Icarus Complex Magazine. Wonderful. And Christine Mueller, you can often find at the Wilmette Institute. There's several of her videos of her uh, lectures and workshops that she's done as well. And she does continuing workshops on a Baha'i perspective on climate change at the Wilmette Institute. Is there anything else we can direct folks to around your work, Christine? Well, maybe it would be of service to the listeners to know about the website of the International Environment Forum, because oh, there yes. they can find all, all the information um, and really quotations, scientific facts, uh, everything that pertains to the environment and the Baha'i faith, and also interfaith. Uh, there are also resources for other religions. Well, that's something we didn't. And what is the website again, please? IEFworld.org. Okay, great. And all of these links uh, will be here in the bio page of this podcast, wherever you, or YouTube video, wherever you find this video or or podcast. But um, and that's another thing we didn't even get into is the importance of interfaith work around this. Mm -hmm. You know, Baha'is, you know, our our paltry five or six million Baha'is are not going to do this, even with our our friends and coworkers. You know, we need all the people of all the different religious faiths to turn to those central spiritual teachings that have to do with the sanctity of the earth, unity and diversity, how nature is a reflection of the glory of God, and help kind of dig into the spiritual solutions and the spiritual inspiration and motivation for healing this really difficult, challenging, and complicated issue. So thank you again, everyone, for joining uh, it was so much fun. This was a dream come true to have this conversation. This is a great service to people that are listening. And uh, I really can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much. Good night.